Hello and welcome to this next topic. This is topic 26 of OCR A-level chemistry. This is redox and electrode potentials. Now, what I've written down here is just a bunch of redox half equations. And you can see that they're written as reductions in the forward reaction because they're all gaining electrons and then oxidations for the reverse reaction. And I've written them in a specific order. The reactions at the bottom, the equilibrium sits far to the right. And as you go up, that equilibrium sits further and further to the left. And so lithium becomes lithium 1 plus quite readily, and fluorine becomes fluorine 1 minus or fluoride quite readily as well. And then everything in between is written in a specific order to show how much they want to be oxidized or how much they want to be reduced. And we call things that want to be oxidized, so like lithium, good reducing agents, because a reducing agent is something which reduces other things and therefore itself it is oxidised. And at the bottom are the best oxidising agents, because they are the ones which themselves are most readily reduced, which means that they can oxidise other things. So you'll recognise, hopefully, dichromate here as the oxidising agent that we used when we oxidised alcohols to carboxylic acids and ketones and aldehydes in Unit 4. And permanganate is a stronger oxidising agent than even dichromate. And if we look at these, we pick any two, we can make a redox equation from those just by combining them so that the one that wants to be reduced is being reduced and the one that wants to be oxidised is being oxidised. And as such, we kind of have a reactivity series. You'll notice that you've got lithium, which is a reactive metal at the top, and then further down, iron, which is less reactive, and copper, which is even less reactive. This here is iron 3 plus becoming iron 2 plus. And this is by no means complete. I've just taken a handful of the different reductions that can happen and written those out in order. So let's do that. I'm just going to pick two at random and make a redox equation from those, a full redox equation. Okay, so I'm just going to use this aluminium 3 plus gaining 3 electrons and this iron 3 plus gaining 1 electron become iron 2 plus. The first thing you have to decide is which one of those is going to be reduced and which is going to be oxidised. So the one which is going to be reduced is the one which is further down, so that iron 3 plus being reduced to iron 2 plus. And therefore, aluminium is going to become aluminium 3 plus. So because iron 3 plus is more readily reduced to become iron 2 plus, and aluminium is more readily oxidised to become aluminium 3 plus, then that all works out. The other thing we have to do is make sure that the electron transfer is the same. So in this one, there's three electrons being transferred but in this one there's only one electron being transferred. So first of all you need to balance the electrons and then essentially you just add them together. So what I've done is I've rewritten the aluminium one as an oxidation reaction, so aluminium losing three electrons, and then I've times the iron one all by three. So there's three iron three plus, each gaining an electron, so three electrons make three iron two plus. Then all you do is you add the left hand side, add the right hand side, and these three electrons will cancel out that's why we made them the same, so that it was just a normal redox reaction. And what I like to do at the end is just to check everything balances, so aluminium, aluminium, from iron, and iron, but also check that the charge is balanced. So here I've got 9 plus, and then 3 plus, and another 6 makes 9 plus. So with redox equations, I always check using charge as well as the normal balancing method to make sure it balances out. And so you can predict so many reactions from this set of data, you can say that lithium is going to react with aluminium 3 plus to make aluminium and lithium 1 plus. Or you can say that lithium reacts with water to make hydrogen and lithium hydroxide, which of course it does. These are just reactions that we know, but you can now predict all of them. The feasibility of all of these reactions can be determined by knowing which ones are more easily oxidised or more easily reduced. But the same as with the entropy one last lesson, kinetics or rates of reaction also has an effect on this. So this isn't the be-all and end-all, it just gives you what reactions are possible and what reactions aren't possible. But bear in mind that these are all just equilibria. So you can shift the position of an equilibria, as we know, by changing the temperature, for instance, or increasing the concentration on one side. And there's a thing called a redox titration. Now the titrations we've done so far have been acid-base titrations where the acid and the base react to make water, and then you measure the end point using pH methods, like indicators which change by pH. But you can do that also using a redox reaction. 
Uh, and there's one here, second from the bottom, that you can use. If you're oxidising something using manganate 7, manganate 7 is a deep purple. Once all the manganate's been used up, you end up with manganese 2 plus, which is a very pale pink colour, almost colourless. So there's a very obvious end point to this reaction. Once all the manganate 7 has been used, there's no colour left. And you could do a similar thing with thiosulfate. Now thiosulfate reacts with iodine to make peroxidized sulfate and iodine. And only one of those things is colour, and that's the iodine. So when all the thiosulfate has been reacted with the iodine, the reaction goes colourless. And you can test the endpoint of that using starch as well, because if you add starch to something that contains iodine, it goes a deep blue-black colour. And in my video on the iodine clock reaction, I'm going to the thiosulfate peroxidized sulfate reaction in much more detail. So make sure you watch that if you want any more details about that reaction. So we've got all of this data, and it's qualitative because all I've just done is put them in an order. And the next thing I'm going to talk about is how to make all this data quantitative, which makes it just more useful. And to do that, what we really need to do is set a standard. As chemists often do, we put a standard in somewhere just to compare everything to a standard. And the standard we use is this one. 2H plus gain in two electrons to make hydrogen. We call that the standard, and then we compare everything to that. So we set hydrogen as zero. But zero watt. Now, because these are all about electron transfers and the potential for electrons to be gained or lost by something, then if you have two of them, then what you've actually got is a potential difference, a voltage between two halves of a reaction. And the bigger the difference, the bigger the voltage. And you can measure these voltages if you set up one half of the reaction and the other half of the reaction and then put a voltmeter between them. So I'm just going to put them up on the board to show you how you would set up to measure a standard electrode potential, which is what these are called. Each of these makes one electrode. You pick two, each one forms one half of a cell, and then you put them together, and then the voltage of that cell is determined by how different they are in terms of their oxidation and reduction, or how much they want electrons, or how much they don't want electrons. And to do this and keep it super standard, as we know chemists always like to, we have to use standard conditions, so room temperature and pressure, and standard solution, which is one molar solution. And what I'm going to draw first of all is how you would do this for just calculating the standard electro potential of each of these. And to measure the standard electro potential of them, you have to use the standard electrode and put one of the other ones as the other electrode. So we're going to have half of the cell, which is the standard half cell, which is the hydrogen one and then the other half cell as one of the other reactions. And so this is the standard cell that you set up. On this side is the standard hydrogen electrode, which has H+, plus because we need the H+, plus, and hydrogen gas, because we need the hydrogen gas. And this electrode here, because we need some way for the H+, plus ions and the H2 to change into each other, this electrode is the surface at which that happens. And it's made of platinum, to make sure that it's not interfering with the reaction. Because platinum is a very inert metal. And in fact, a platinum electrode is used for any of these half cells which don't contain a metal. So over here I've used iron as the electrode because iron is in the equation that I decided to use, which was this one. But if I decided to have used this one, then I'd need a platinum electrode because nothing there is a metal. Other things, I've used one molar solutions for the acid and for the iron 2+, plus, because one molar solution is the standard, it's all at 298 Kelvin, which is standard temperature. The hydrogen is at one atmosphere, so standard pressure. And then there's one other thing that you need to use, which is a salt bridge to complete the circuit. So we've got almost an entire circuit, but the salt bridge just allows ion transfer between the two solutions, and thus completing the circuit. And when you're doing this, the salt bridge is normally just a piece of filter paper soaked in a salt, which is potassium nitrate. And this is how you'd set it up. It's very similar for a lot of the other ones. For all the metals, it's almost exactly the same, just with different metals and different solutions. For the ones which don't contain metals, then you need a platinum electrode and then a different solution. Just remember, everything has to be one molar, and if there's a gas, it needs to be at room pressure, so it's just one atmosphere. And why do we do this? It was to calculate this voltage to see if iron was more oxidizing or more reducing than hydrogen. And because I've drawn it higher than this, that means that the iron is more easily 
oxidise, so the hydrogen is. And what that means is the iron is going to be losing electrons, which makes it the negative electrode. So this side is going to be the negative side, and the hydrogen side will be the positive side. And it turns out, if you set this up using standard conditions, then you get 0.44 volts as a minus, showing that this one is the negative electrode. And so when I wrote 0.00, .00 here, that means that if I set up two hydrogen electrodes, there's no electron transfer between them one way or the other because they're both the same. So you end up with 0.00 volts. There's no potential for the electrons to go one way or the other because both the electrodes are exactly the same. So all of these reactions have a standard electrode potential and I'll fill those all in now. And so all the ones above hydrogen are more readily oxidised. All the ones below hydrogen are more readily reduced. And so this number tells you how readily it is reduced. And so when I did that reaction before between aluminium and iron 3 plus becoming iron 2 plus, it was the iron 3 plus that became iron 2 plus because this one is more positive than this one is. And it's always the more positive one, so the one lower down the list, which is reduced, and the more negative one, which is oxidised. And this is more useful than just setting up this table to say what reactions can and cannot happen. You can actually work out the potential difference if you set these up as two parts of a set. So this one had a voltage of minus 0.44 volts. But if we look at the one we did earlier between iron 3 plus to iron 2 plus and aluminium, we can work out the voltage as just the difference between those two. And so that cell would have a 2.43 volt EMF. And you can alter the EMF by using different chemicals. So if I used copper, then it would have a smaller voltage. If I used fluorine, then they would have a bigger voltage. And this is the basics for how chemical cells work and on how you determine the voltage of that chemical cell. That's one other thing I'll talk about, and it's coming back to that equilibrium thing I said earlier in the video, which was, these are all equilibrium reactions. You know, if I increase the concentration of my iron 3 plus solution, then that pushes this equilibrium further to the right, and so this becomes more positive because going to the right or being reduced makes things more positive. And so if I change the condition by changing the concentration to say two molar, then this number will become more positive. And so you might end up with say 0.1 there. You don't need to be able to work out the change in voltage, but you need to be able to talk about it qualitatively. And it all comes from equilibrium. So if I go back to that aluminium and iron one we did earlier, if I used a stronger iron three plus solution, but kept everything else the same, and the voltage of that cell would go up from 2.43. And the more I increase this concentration, the higher it would go. Equally, if I lowered the concentration of iron 2 plus, you'd get the same happening. And you could do both of those. Or you could change the concentration of the aluminium solution. And so there's lots of things which affect these. These are all just standard, which means that they're done at a very specific temperature, pressure, and with concentrations of exactly one molar. And if you change any of those things, then you change these numbers and you can change them to suit you. So if you want to change the voltage, then you can change the voltage. And with these, I think it's very easy to just think in your mind just about displacement reactions. So you think about aluminium and iron. Aluminium is more reactive than iron, so aluminium becomes a 3 plus iron, and iron 2 plus becomes a metal. So just a normal displacement reaction. And I think it's very easy to just leave it at that. But these contain more than just metals. These contain so many different chemicals. And so there's another option we need to talk about, and that is combustion reactions. And so normally when you burn something, you get collisions between molecules of the fuel and molecules of oxygen, they react, and you get energy out, there's heat. But what you can do, the same as you can do with other things, is instead of colliding them together, is put them both in contact with the same electrolyte. You get a transfer of ions through the electrolyte, and the transfer of electrons through a wire. And so you can set it up to be a cell. And that's how hydrogen fuel cells work. And actually, all fuel cells, you have basically a combustion reaction, but you separate the oxygen from the fuel. And so you have to transfer the electrons via a wire, and then you can use that electricity to power something. And that's how fuel cells work. And so there's one example here. This is just a simple hydrogen fuel cell with an acid electrolyte. On this side, you get hydrogen becoming H plus ions and electrons. And then on the other side, those H plus ions and electrons 
combine with oxygen or half an oxygen molecule to make water. So you can see hopefully that it's H2 plus half O2 makes H2O, so just a normal combustion of hydrogen reaction. But the two H plus ions and the two electrons get transferred through this solution and the electrons go through the wire and then whatever you put here, it powers it. So it could be a motor or if we put a voltmeter there, then we can measure the voltage of this. Now this is obviously just a standard hydrogen electrode, so it has zero and this is the standard electrode potential for this half equation and so the voltage of this would be 1.23 if you did it in standard conditions. Obviously if you change the concentration of your H plus solution, that has an effect. If you change the temperature, it has an effect or the pressure of the hydrogen, the pressure of the oxygen. All of these things have an effect and so this voltage can be changed, but it's the basics of using fuel cells that you need to understand, which is you separate the oxygen and the fuel and then you do the reaction, but via an electrolyte medium and a wire, which the current then is used to power stuff. And that is it for this topic on redox and electropotentials. Hope you can join me in the next one. Goodbye.